Welcome, everybody. Hello, and thank you so much for being here. This is Spirit Matters, your daily spiritual check-in, and we're coming at you live from New York. My name is Dal Grunga, and I'm here with Paris Stu and our live Zoom studio audience and you, wherever you are from. You made it today. You are getting through today. Today is going to be okay. And this is spirit reaching out to you, into your heart, into your life, reminding you that you are not alone, that you are held, you are being guided. It's not me speaking. It's not Paris Stu speaking. It's supreme spirit reaching through the airwaves because that's how we communicate. God communicates to us in various beautiful ways through other people, through life circumstances. There was once, I think there was, and I haven't even asked how you're doing, Paris, too. Sometimes I just got rolling. But I remember there was this one story about like a Buddhist teacher. I don't know if it actually happened or it was just like some some parable. But basically the Buddhist teacher was um, doing a program or a, a, uh, an event with a bunch of other student monks and he stood up there and he just held up a flower and everyone was trying to figure out this meaning of the flower and what's what's he trying to teach us with the flower and everyone was thinking and everyone was kind of confused and staring and meditating and thinking about the flower and there's one student who just looked at it and smiled that was it and the buddhist master said that that person has understood what i'm trying to teach and was like what is it and he said, it's just the beauty of the flower, you know, and it was just that we miss simple things sometimes because we're looking for some deep, big lesson or God's going to speak to us in some big, profound way. But when you just look at the beauty of a flower, you can see God's presence when you look at the sunshine coming through your room in the morning. And so we see the ways in which God is, is reaching out into our lives um, in in simple but powerful ways, and also similarly in ways that we hear from other people. And that's what we're here for. And that's why I've got Paris Stu on here, because she is an expression of God's love in my life and in our lives. And we're so glad that you're here to share with us. How are you doing this morning, Paris Stu? Feeling super grateful to be here for just what you shared about appreciating simplicity and feeling the sunlight in the room that I'm in, seeing all these beautiful faces and seeing you. I'm really happy to be here. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yesterday, we got to hear some of your story and your kind of searching and journeys and reflections on making spiritual life real for us. Um, and you shared with me this beautiful verse that we thought we could use to anchor our conversation today. And then reading this first, maybe we can, you, you, you sent me via text some other um, events that took place in your life um, that were quite significant that led you to put you in a state of, of confusion and challenge, but ultimately led you towards a lot of searching and a lot of inquiring and ultimately surrendering and uh, deepening of your of your understanding of yourself and of life and of God and the relationship of all those things. So with that, we can we can launch into that. But we start with this beautiful verse that that we read. Um, and maybe do you want to read this first? You sent it to me. I have it pulled up on my computer, but I thought maybe you should read it because people need a break from the sound of my voice. <laughs> I don't know. You got a really great voice, Dale. Thank you. I've got a I I practice in the mirror. <laughs> You know, there was that there was this story, you can look it up, of a man who um, was homeless. He was a homeless man and he got, this is early, early, early YouTube days. And he, somebody, he would go and he would ask people for donations um, at car windows and stop cars, I think in Los Angeles or somewhere. And uh, he had this voice, like this boomer announcer voice and he would go and he would ask for donations and people thought that his voice was quite striking and they videoed him asking for donations and then like doing these like pretend announcements and commercial ads and they put him on YouTube and he got so much traction that he actually got hired as an announcer and now he's like I think he's like a professional announcer somewhere or something it's this whole story I'll look it up somebody want to somebody want to look that story up <laughs> look for us homeless Announcer voice, not you, Paris. Do um, and send us a little article. We can read it. But uh, anyways, Hari Krishna. 
I'm a tan. It looks I'm like tan. there's I'm quite a bit on this person. Right? Williams. What's his name? Ted Williams. Ted Williams. Is Ted Williams. Paris, now we're looking it up. We're supposed to have other people looking it up so that <laughs> we can. Golden voice. No, not Ted. Ted Williams is a basketball, as a baseball player, but there's another one. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Ted Williams announcer. Ted Williams, the American announcer. Yeah, known as the man with the golden voice, born in Brooklyn. In January 2011, Williams received widespread media attention with the interview filmed during a period when he was homeless, went viral after being posted to YouTube, and Williams subsequently received numerous job offers. For the first time in almost 20 years, Williams found himself steadily working. He co-authored A Golden Voice, How Faith, Hard Work, and Humility Brought Me from the Streets to Salvation with Brett Witter. You know what that makes me think? Yeah. Krishna is the ability in man. Krishna is the ability in all of us. Actually, there's no ability that we have that's not Krishna. Yeah. Wow. It says here, according to Williams, his life started falling apart in 1986 with a combination of drug and alcohol abuse, plus a loss of interest in his career. In 1994, he was evicted from his house. During this period, William was arrested at least seven times on charges, including theft, drug possession, escape, and robbery. He was also issued misdemeanor citations for drug abuse, criminal trespassing, and pedestrian solicitation. These resulted in two jail sentences, and William served three months in 1990 for theft and nearly two months in 2004 for theft, forgery, and obstructing official business. He's a father of nine children, two boys and seven girls. Wow. Wow. And then somehow somebody clipped a video of him on YouTube and he said the man with the golden voice and he was picked up with job offers. He met, he had an interview in 2012, an interview on the today show with Kathy Lee Gifford. And in the interview, he said he had been clean and sober for over a year. It was working and doing well. And in his book, he reflects on his time. This is what Wikipedia says. He reflects on his time prostituting himself and his girlfriend while abandoning his children for his cocaine addiction. Hare Krishna. He wanted to discuss his post fame relapse. You're going to read a Bhagavatam. I'm going to read a Bhagavatam class on Ted Williams. Well, I just think here's here's what I think. I think it's just it's just a it shows that we don't know where life is going to lead us. And I think that that um, it's easy for us to discard people. Um, and we live in New York City, and there's a lot of homeless people around, and there's a lot of people that it's easy to just walk by, and you get you get desensitized to it almost. You know, someone's asking for money, and they're poor, and they're struggling, whether they're a disabled man in a wheelchair, or a woman with a child, or or anybody, and you just get desensitized to it because you think like if I gave, like, there's just too many people to give money to. And then you just think about, you know, how did they get here? So you just get desensitized and you just kind of like discard people and you just kind of move on. And if you were to hear that background, you were to think like, oh, I want nothing to do with that person. But then when you hear the redemption story and recognize that, you know, when you read the Gita and you talk about the spiritual nature of every living being, it reminds you that Krishna never gives up on any of us. And that we don't need to give up on anybody else either. And it's, I just I just think it's inspiring when people's lives turn around. I love that. And you also, I mean, we never we we didn't even read the verse yet. I've been talking too much. Paris, I want you to read the verse that we said we were going to read today. Okay. All right. That's why I shouldn't talk too much. No, you're read wondering- the biography of Ted Williams. <laughs> what? Okay. So this is from the Bhagavatam 11th Canto. 11th Canto, chapter 2, verse 42. I heard this um, at the retreat, the Holy Name Retreat in New Vrindavan. Um, This is one of the verses that came up. So I'll just read the English translation. Devotion, direct experience of the Supreme Lord and detachment from other things. These things. Three occurs simultaneously for one who has taken shelter of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. In the same way, 
that pleasure, nourishment, and relief from hunger come simultaneously and increasingly with each bite for a person engaged in eating. Hmm. What was it about this verse that made you want to share it? Uh, so we were talking yesterday um, quite a bit about like nourishment and hunger and appetite. And, right. It's like um, I was listening to Radhanath Maharaj talk about like how in Ayurveda they say that hunger is necessary for even digesting. Mm -hmm. So I started to reflect again on this verse that I heard the other week and just about this process of like, right, spiritual life, you know, it needs to be digested. Right. And I think that I have a tendency with my personality to just like take in things um, and just be like, oh, this is interesting. This is interesting. This is interesting. Versus like, how do I take this and like journal about what I just read and mm -hmm. apply it? Like, how does this apply to my life? And that was something when I went on this retreat that had a really big impact on me was like, I'm going to commit to writing at least 15 minutes, if not longer every day of just like, what am I realizing? What are the realizations? Because sometimes I take for granted that like, oh, I have this realization. I'm like, oh my God, this is amazing. But if I don't write it down, it's like, I could very well forget. In fact, often I read my old realizations or reflections and it's like, oh, I forgot that I ever thought that, or I forgot that I had that realization or made that connection. So uh, just how important it is to reflect and churn. Um, that is what Sangha does for us, this community. Um, and it also is what, like spending the time to go and like really sit with ourselves and think, what is this teaching me? How do I apply this to my life? What am I meant to learn? Yeah, yeah. Uh, it reminds me of something that I we talk about experience, wisdom comes from experience, right? We learn from experiences, but actually it's not experiences that teach us, it's evaluated experiences that teach us. It's when we have an experience of life and we take the time to evaluate and assess and digest what happened, what did we learn from it, et cetera. And I think in spiritual life, there's a lot of a thought, I've got to just input information or I got to start putting in putting something into practice because it happens a lot when we start spiritual practice is it starts to bring up all of the things in ourselves that need to start transform and that we 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 recognize you know i saw it was, i saw a, a little meme or video just yesterday and it was this somehow it was this cat in this massive um yeah it was a cat in this massive crowd of like small chickens just chirping crazily and it said, this is, you know, my mind is the cat and all these chickens are my thoughts. And this is me trying to meditate. You know, this idea of just trying to be peaceful and meditate, but there's just like this constant inundation of thoughts and distractions, et cetera. And sometimes it's not until we start trying something that we realize how much we have to grow. And so I think that, um, yeah, putting things into practice and then noticing what comes up and what it, what we learn about ourselves in the process is as important as just going through the motions of something. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. That's uh thanks for sharing that. Um, it made me think about like how meditation is, it's such a interaction with the mind, right? Cause it's like, Hey mind, thank you for all of your thoughts. But how can I let the mind rest for a moment? Like, just like you can rest, you can actually like rest and be nourished here in this like practice that we're going to do, whether it's a breathing exercise or a mantra meditation or like to bring the mind and let it rest. Because mm. the mind is just like, it's designed to be like, like the chicken the, the cat in the midst of the chickens. It's just yeah, like, I miss the chickens. what's going on? Where is it happening? Oh, there, what about that? That, like, this person has pink hair. Like, there's a dog. Like, it's just designed to think and feel and will. I want this. I want that. 
what about this? Maybe I don't want this. And that's just what the mind does. And then it's like, how do we take that feeling, thinking and willing and say, here you go. You just get to rest for the next minutes. What does your journaling practice look like? Do you have prompts that you ask yourself or do you think about experiences of the day or is it just whatever comes to your mind? Um, I think that, okay. Um, I have been reading Bhakti Tirta Swami and um, he talks a lot about how important it is to write about what you're reading. So like mm-hmm. if I'm reading something to write about what I'm reading and then also to try to apply it to my own life and see what other questions come up. Um, so that's one thing. Sometimes I just write whatever's on my mind Um, sometimes I'll be like, what am I grateful for? So, but that's a good question, Dayal. How about for you? What, I don't know, like in terms of the healthiest writing practices, like, because the questions you ask yourself are really important. And in fact, they Mm -hmm. drive your whole life. Questions you ask yourself drive the course of our lives. Mm. That's a beautiful, beautiful reflection, the questions that we ask ourselves and how often do we ask ourselves meaningful questions and not only how often do we ask ourselves meaningful questions, but how often do we create space to reflect on the answers to those meaningful questions that we ask ourselves. And I think also the answers to those questions evolve at different times in our lives. You know, you may ask yourself a question today and tomorrow it might be a totally different reflection on it. Or sometimes you have to ask yourself a question repeatedly enough to actually get to the um, deeper layers of what the answer really might be, you know, what's driving me? What are my fears? What are my motivations? What am I excited about? What do I, what do I want to see happen in my life? And you might, you might ask yourself those questions and a surface level answer might pop up, but it's not until you continuously ask yourself those questions over and over that you give yourself space to understand the deepest answers you have inside yourself. It's kind of like asking somebody, how are you doing? You just asking somebody how you're doing, and you might say, "I'm doing okay." And you ask them, "So yeah. how are you doing?" Imagine like just you, you, you. Sometimes you do these exercises with another person. You know, two people will sit across from each other, and we'll ask the same question back and forth, back and forth. How are you doing? How are you doing? How are you doing? How are you doing? You know, what is something? What you know? Uh, and you just kind of you know, what are you grateful for? What are you grateful for? What are you grateful for? You kind of ask these questions over and over, and it forces you to kind of think deeper and come to a deeper answer. And I think that we don't really get to know ourselves deeply enough unless we create that space to repeatedly ask ourselves meaningful questions and allow ourselves to uncover the deeper answers of what's there. One thing that is coming up from just hearing you say this is like this distinction of two types of questions. Um, One I would just call maybe less useful and negative and maybe one that is more useful and somewhat positive. So one example of a less useful or not useful question is like, why am I such an idiot? Right? Like I've been asking myself that for a long time. Like, why am why did I why do I always screw up? Like a better question to ask is like, what am I failing to see? What am I failing to see? So like that way something opens up. Cause then I'll be, I'll be given an answer versus like, you know, why am I an idiot is just like going to reinforce the, the narrative of like, oh, I'm, I'm not like, I'm going to look for reasons. Right. Mm. Versus like, there's something that can open or be revealed in the question of like, what am I failing to see? So that is a question I often ask myself or I ask my mentors and coaches. Um, Cause sometimes I feel like they can see what I'm not seeing. Um, And that's tough because sometimes we don't even want to see what we're not seeing, which is also, that's probably the hardest thing. And we have to have that willingness or desire once again, which is kind of like the essential component. I feel like it's been a theme from yesterday too, around desire and, you know, wanting to. Mm, Wanting to. Wanting to what? To grow, to grow mm. spiritually, 
to like see our egos and want to like peel these layers of ego away that are not beneficial. Mm. Well, I think, I think there's a beautiful, um, we reference this verse often in the podcast from Queen Kunti, who talks about that, that God is easily approachable by those who are materially exhausted. Um, when, you know, we talk about there's a desire to grow, right? A desire to kind of go somewhere. But then it also stems from a, a, an exhaustion of what I'm doing now isn't working. And so when we talk about devotion, direct experience, and detachment or other things, I'm reading the verse again that you read earlier. These three occur simultaneously for one has taken shelter the Supreme Personality of Godhead in the same way that pleasure, nourishment, and relief from hunger come simultaneously and increasingly with each bite for a person engaged in eating. So it's talking about nourishment through our practices. And we talk about like a desire to grow, but also I think there has to be a motivation that... Um, it's not just growing for growing sake, but it's, 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 I want to experience the nourishment and satisfaction of, of, of getting to a place where I can experience life differently. Like I, I, I want, we talk about growth, but I think growth is also really meaning seeing life differently. Um, growth means expanding my mindset. Growth means um, expanding my ability to look at the world differently and mm -hmm. rather than through, like you were talking about, a narrowed lens of of assumptions. You know, when you say, "Why am I such an idiot?" There's an assumption that I am an idiot. You know, I've already come to that conclusion, as opposed to recognizing something different about myself and different about other people. Why are they such? Why are they such an idiot? Well, maybe they're not such an idiot. I'm coming to that assumption, and I can start to open up. And because I want to, I want to experience life differently. I want to experience life not from a place of of bitterness and judgment and resentment and superiority or inferiority or comparison but i want to experience life from a place of compassion a place of connection a place of upliftment a place of empowerment a place of of joy and gratitude um, and those are the natural qualities of the soul and so it's important for me to 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 get a taste of those things as you're talking about when i have a taste of those things i want more you know, my dog loves frozen fruit. I have yeah. frozen fruit that I like to snack on sometimes in the evening. And when he hears that freezer open and he hears a little <clears throat> crinkling in the back, wherever he is, he could be dead asleep underneath the bed. And you'll hear his little pattering feet come running around the corner. All of a sudden he's in the kitchen like you rang, you know, and there's just an expectation. Why? Because, because I, why? Because I gave him frozen fruit one day. And he just was like, I need more of that, you know? And so without that little taste initially, it's that little taste that we get that inspires us, I need more of that. And if we're not tasting our the nourishment of our spiritual life regularly, we're going to forget and we're going to lose enthusiasm and, and inspiration to pursue it. And therefore, it's so important that we find opportunities and we... It's hard sometimes when we we talk about self care, self nourishment, or self love and spiritual life, and that we're not we're not talking about bubble baths and 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 hash bound breakfasts, which you know those are important as well. What we're talking about making sure that you're giving yourself opportunities to feel nourished in your spiritual life, taking time for yourself, taking rest, taking break, taking opportunities to connect with other people, and go deep in your practice enough that you're feeling. So as as Leslie just says, spiritually rest and digest. Mm. <laughs> so that's what I'm getting from you, Paris, too, and I appreciate that. Oh, thank you. Just hearing you share this, Dayal, um, makes me think like that nourishment of like the broader vision. Mm. Of that verse of the Gita, um, the humble sages by virtue of true knowledge mm. with equal vision, a learned and gentle Brahmana, a cow, an elephant, a dog, and a dog eater. And those dog like, eaters to see with equal vision, like, whoa, if, if just for a minute, like, like coming back to Ted Williams, who came up in the beginning, but just how do you see without like this insensitivity of like, let me just guard myself because I'm in the city and I don't want to break out into tears. 
but to see like, oh, this is a spirit soul. This is a spirit soul. This dog is a spirit soul. And just everywhere I look to see the spirit soul, that is the nourishment that we're seeking. And it's actually, oh yeah, we're all spirit souls in relationship with the Supreme. Hmm. we've been lost in a material world and we've forgotten who we are yeah please remember we're all suffering beautifully put thank you we've reached our time for today so we're going to turn over to kimberly who's got some takeaways for us and what we're walking away with and then we'll close have a few closing words what you got for us kimberly all right taking away to see god in the simplicity Krishna is the ability in us. No one is too lost for a transformation to occur because Krishna never gives up on us. Nourish life with spiritual rest and digestion. Repeatedly ask meaningful questions like, what am I failing to see? And that growth is widening our lens to see life differently. Thank you. Thank you. What are you walking away with today, Paris Stu? Um, I think the, the last point that Kimberly brought up and where we've kind of been churning here, um, growth is widening our lens to see life differently. Um, that expansive view, that is what nourishes us. So thinking about the nourishment of the higher taste of experiencing something deeper um, versus just trying to like like, where am I growing towards, right? Like just, oh, let me remove this bad thing versus like, maybe there's a, you know, there's that power that just breaks all the other things. Because if I connect to that really deep real identity, then these other things kind of have the capacity to just become very irrelevant or very small in comparison. Yeah, thank you. I loved how you mentioned about reading and then journaling and reflecting about what we're reading. Because especially for me as somebody, as, as a teacher and somebody that is often thinking about reading something so that I can share it with others, which is, which is also nice. Um, you sometimes forget about like, what am I taking just for me? You know, and in a, in a, in a, in a, in a highly, in a share culture where it's like we share everything, we share our desserts, we share our walks in the park, we share our vacations, we share quotes that we heard, you know, you read something, you want to take a picture of it and put it on social media. And in a share culture, it's rare that we find something meaningful and inspiring and just keep it to ourselves mm. and just hold it for ourselves in a way that let me just digest and experience and like, how is this, how am I just applying this for me? How is this for me right now? And just swimming in that a little bit. And I found that beautiful because I lose sight of that and I lose that sometimes. And um, I think, but it is very valuable. And so you reminded me of that and I'm grateful. Thank you. Okay, beautiful. Thank you for all the beautiful comments that we got going on here from all the people. Thank you so much. It's really beautiful sharing and encouraging. And thank you for listening for all of you. Thank you, Paris Stu, for being here, being with us. It's enlivening and grateful. Love your energy and appreciation. And we look forward to seeing you guys, 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 yeah. gals, everybody uh, tomorrow. Same time, same place. Take care, everybody. Be well. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you.